the world. Back here with Monday morning or Monday afternoon or evening, depending where you're watching us from today, edition of VCTV. Uh, on VCTV, we like to uh, depict various tech technologies and topics uh, that are happening in the world and things that are shifting with them along with the investments and how you should be looking at them as well and where the opportunities may be. Uh, today's topics are artificial intelligence and virtual reality, two huge pieces of this new digitized world that we're moving into. When it comes to artificial intelligence, we've been talking about AI for many years, both positive, negative, and a little bit of something in between, unsure of how this was gonna grow and develop. What we're starting to see now is this become more of an infrastructure piece, which our panel will challenge me on a little bit today, and how it's empowering our world. When it comes to virtual reality, again, something we've been looking at for decades at this point, but now may or may not be finally here. We're gonna hear a little bit about what's happening in these spaces, where the investing opportunities are, where the building opportunities are, and how our investors from their various viewpoints around the world are either investing or building or something in between in these areas. So without further ado, uh, a quick shout out to Elena and to the entire LE Token team for bringing us together, making today possible. To you, our live audience as well, at any point since we are live, if you have questions, comments, feel free to drop them in the comments box. The team and I will do our best to ask them in real time. If not, we'll hold them to the end, but all of us are available on social media so you can easily reach out and follow up at any time. And if you like today's episode, click subscribe, the thumbs up as well, and let's get started. So uh, investors, welcome all to the show. We wanna give a chance for each of you to introduce yourself. Uh, and so this will be a little Brady Bunch style. I'll call on each of you. Just a quick introduction uh, of who you are, your company, and how you got into the, the respected space. Uh, so Henry, let's start with you over in my uh, upper left corner. Hi, so uh, I'm Henry Staley. I'm originally an entrepreneur. I've been up since 1995 or so. I started uh, BizRay.com Shopzilla back in uh, uh, 1996. And uh, Right now, I'm doing a lot of investing, and uh, I'm also uh, doing still some entrepreneurship, uh, keeping my hands, uh, uh, you know, uh, dirty, so to speak. Uh, I started, uh, I co-founded uh, Lead Ventures, which is a, uh, a venture capital company that uh, invests in early stage companies in uh, the MENA region, uh, uh, Lebanon and, and Europe as well, especially France. And I also do um, angel investing on the side. So I do a lot of stuff. I like it. Uh, I'm, I feel it's going to be a similar thread throughout today's episode. All of us do a lot of things. Uh, welcome to the show. Excited to have you. Nicole, uh, same to you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having me. And um, I'm here in, in San Francisco. So hello to everybody viewing now and later. Um, I have a long career of uh, working with a lot of the leaders in the Silicon Valley. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with, you know, the likes of Eric Schmidt and Steve Jobs reported to him directly for a number of years and I got my life back and um, I started consulting and I started my first consultancy um, in the late 90s. It's going to date me, but oh well, I'm going with it. Um, and at that point, I started taking equity stakes in companies and these were a lot of the next customers, actually. Um, so when we sold the company to Apple, um, I stay, I continued to consult to these companies and a few of them popped. And so I got a taste of what it was like to have um, some equity in early stage companies and take a ride with them. So then after that, I continued with a business model of not only providing a lot of marketing services, but also investing, um, whether that was a trade for services or outright an investment. Uh, so I've actually helped to build a good number of incubators and uh, funds. Um, my latest fund is called How Women Invest. 
It's a fund um, created by mainly, mainly we have female LPs, um, but we have some men too. And we're investing in companies that are 50% female owned. And I'm happy to say um, all the companies we're looking at right now are women of color. So um, that's also really wonderful. And there are great returns uh, investing in women of color. Um, and then my day job is I am a consultant um, uh, providing marketing, go-to-market strategies and business development services. So happy to be here. Right on, welcome to the show. Excited to dive deeper into to that as well. Rana, welcome. You've been here before, Thanks, you know the drill. Uh, introduction, a little background. Good to be back. Um, happy Monday morning to everybody. I guess it's not morning everywhere. Um, so I, I tend to, my name is Rana Gujral. Um, I tend to oscillate between being a full-time entrepreneur and a full-time investor. Uh, I've been doing both for, uh, for a long time. Um, I typically tend to invest uh, post-seed pre-A into specific areas of my expertise, uh, mostly operationally minded since I'm largely an entrepreneur and uh, investing a lot lately into certain minutia aspects of fintech, which we're not going to talk about today, but a lot into AI, which we will talk about today. Um, I am also currently leading uh, AI startup today called Behavioral Signals. And um, so from what I see out there, uh, there's some big mega shifts uh, in large trends. It's, it's, it's actually a very, um, I'd say, you know, it's, it's a scary time for a lot of people, but it's also very exciting because you can kind of sort of see some of these trends forming in front of your eyes. And I feel like I've been here before. And, uh, you know, oftentimes um, in the past when those trends have been forming right, right in front of you, um, you're not paying attention or you just don't have enough insights or enough, uh, I guess, data points to connect those dots. This time around, uh, I think those are pretty prevalent. And so from that perspective, it's a fantastic time to invest. It's a fantastic time to plan ahead and build a portfolio that will come to fruition in the next 10, 15 years. Um, so from an investment standpoint, I tend to do um, you know, a lot of syndicates also through uh, some LP relationships into some value funds. I'm in the SF Bay area. And so from that perspective, get uh, access to a lot of uh, variety of different sizes of deal flow, uh, do some angel investing, not too much lately. I used to do that back in the day. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's the big stuff. We'll talk more. Awesome. Well, since you're both in the Bay Area, you and Nicole, sounds like you guys might want to talk afterwards. Uh, it's a perfect, uh, perfect match. Um, well, welcome to the show, Rana. Uh, Gary, welcome as well. Uh, same to you. Nice to see you. Yeah, so my name's Gary Fowler, and um, I've done 15 startups. My first one was at 21. Um, you know, I have a venture studio, GSD, which is one of the top AI venture studios that I started about a year and a half ago. Um, I love companies that are um, regionally diverse, multicultural. Uh, I was on the original management team at Click Software, which we sold for 1.35 billion dollars about seven months ago to Salesforce. I actually came up with a name. I was doing the marketing sales biz dev stuff there. Uh, I started the top accelerator in Russia. Um, uh, GSD Venture Studios is my company today. GVA is a company in Russia. I also started the first accelerator at the business school. We had a partnership with MIT. Uh, Skolkova. So I just love it. What I'm seeing right now, which, which incredible is that there's really a no man's land, no person's land between the startup and going global. And that's really where we are today. So we take active, active roles in the companies and help them raise funds since we've got a lot of experience. I'm also an investor. We created a, um, a fairly large fund uh, privately. So I do a bit of uh, investing around. Love to write articles uh, on artificial intelligence. And I've been in AI uh, late 80s, Ops 5 and Lisp. So I know a little bit about it. And I just, uh, this is where the future is. And as, as they say, this is the new electricity. And we all want to be part of it. I like it. Uh, I had the chance to visit Skokovol 
uh, not too long ago and was very, very impressed. So uh, congratulations on that. Um, welcome to the show as well. And, and Adrian, uh, you've been here before. Same to you. Uh, uh, a little background and uh, a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here again. Um, my pitch for today regarding artificial intelligence is that in uh, what I'm doing, I want to, to become impossible to be replaced by a robot. Um, hopefully, it, it will be like that. I don't know. Maybe there are some things where robots are better than me, but with the creativity, hopefully, I will be better than robots. This is one of my obsessions. I'm involved in a um, in few projects. Um, one of them is Faster Capital, which is a Dubai-based accelerator incubator for startups. I'm a regional director for UK and Romania, and basically I recruit startups, and after that I um, help them with the mentoring. Um, it was a noise. It wasn't for me. Um, I'm also involved in Cloudcoin Consortium. Cloudcoin is a post-blockchain digital currency, and uh, I do communications uh, out Outside uh, Canada and United States, also involved in uh, Virgin Startups as a mentor. I'm a sales and marketing person. I believe I have like 25 years of entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship is the hardest job, but it's the only thing I believe that can really change the the world. Artificial intelligence and virtual reality uh, are like air today, so. Uh, it's a, it's a continuous learning process. Thank you very much for having me here. Absolutely, Sumit, welcome to the show. Uh, make sure you unmute yourself. Just a little bit of intro and a little background on yourself. Sure, hello everybody. Um, I'm Sanmeet Jolly. I'm also based here in the Bay Area in San Jose, California. Uh, spent about two decades out living out here. Love the place. Um, and. Uh, the first decade of my career I spent as a corporate salesperson selling uh, IT services to Fortune uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 2000 companies. Um, and then uh, around 2016, I was looking for angel investing opportunities and especially virtual reality. I was uh, really interested in the Oculus gaming, um, etc. So that's how I stumbled upon angel investing. And uh, since then, I've made about 40 investments, uh, smaller chunks, uh, but spread across artificial intelligence, virtual reality, robotics, solar technology, um, health tech, fintech, um, you know, spread the chips accordingly, you know, just, just to make sure that I have enough coverage around technology areas that I, I am interested in or I understand. And luckily now a few are popping up now, uh, you know, one of my success stories uh, in angel investing has been Heliogen, um, Bill Gross's company where now Bill Gates and uh, some other billionaires uh, are coming in and they're, you know, they're announcing some great technology breakthroughs. I'm also an entrepreneur. I started uh, this company uh, a mobile app called Grotu for group travel and events planning initially, but now we want to also add more tools to it. So it's a mobile friendly front end and AWS backend, um, uh, a consumer application, uh, which I got a US patent for recently uh, last year and I have international patents filed. So as an entrepreneur, I'm promoting that uh, app these days. So, you know, you can see that logo on my, <laughs> on my Zoom background as well. We're, we're all dual rolling. We're all we're all investing and we're all entrepreneuring. Uh, the the yeah. the struggles and the the rewards all at the same time. Um, well, welcome to meet. Uh, pleasure to have you, Constantine. Same to you. A quick introduction, a little background on yourself. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so I grew up in Soviet Union with my mother's book on artificial intelligence on the bookshelves. Uh, so uh, that dates me even worse. Uh, and uh, then I went to US. I became a scientist in theoretical physics, did Columbia, Brookhaven, uh, whatnot. Uh, but uh, recently I converted um, 
into health. So my day job is overseeing HPC and AI projects at Institute Pasteur, which is French. I'm speaking to you from Paris, from center of Paris. Pantone is just nearby. So it's analog of National Institute of Health, um, pretty much. Uh, and uh, so that's my day job. And um, then um, later I'm participating in my wife's uh, startup on um, AI in law. So she wants to make law more accessible to people, uh, let um, help um, make an AI which would help comprehend the very complex French law, the Codex Napoleonicus, and make decisions uh, based on um, understanding rather than uh, hope. Um, and recently I've been invited to be on the board of Agroxy, um, agricultural uh, company who suggested for me to participate uh, in uh, your wonderful Zoom. Wow. Well, thank you very much for, for joining. And last but not least, Eli. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me again. Um, I'm based in San Francisco and I uh, love uh, participating in the, uh, in the show and in the forum. So appreciate that. Um, so um, again, uh, like I said, I'm based in San Francisco. I've been in the investment business for over two decades. Uh, I'm part of Bowser Securities, uh, which is a global investment banking firm. We are uh, FINRA member um, and SEC registered broker dealers uh, with offices in New York, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Beijing, and London. Um, and uh, personally, I have been um, investing and also uh, been uh, fortunate enough to uh, build an investment firm uh, where we invested in uh, companies like Proofpoint, which is an Aztec story. Uh, A10 networks, um, and really uh, now as the uh, as the investment bank, uh, a global investment bank, we have the ability to tap into the global investment uh, pools, uh, be it uh, from the institutional side, family offices, and of course strategics. We work very closely with the strategics in uh, in a variety of industries. Uh, one thing that is different from us is that uh, we also have the ability to access the public market. So uh, we're one of the larger investment firms for uh, mid-market IPOs on NASDAQ. Um, so we believe that in addition to the uh, venture capital market um, on the um, high net worth individuals and family offices, we also want to give public the ability to participate in these success stories. And we believe that uh, the, the timing is right. So uh, we, we, we strongly encourage our companies um, to top in the public pool and, uh, and take advantage of the, uh, of the IPO. So uh, that's one thing that's a little bit different for about us is that we have the ability to tap in the public markets as well. Um, and then, you know, regarding the AI and VR, uh, we look at it, from a, uh, from a customer's perspective. From a customer, customer doesn't really care if there's AI. You know, at the end of the day, is it solving the problem? And of course, we look at it from, a, from an actual um, execution point of view, but we want to make sure that the value proposition at the cost that it is being offered is uh, compelling enough from the end customer's point of view. Uh, we actually have AI embedded in multitudes of industries from commodities in the refinement uh, to logistics, supply chain, demand optimization, route optimization, uh, to real estate and healthcare, and uh, same as VR, but love to talk more about it. Um, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, you know, let's let's kick things off with uh, following that is kind of what is the current state of, of AI? I think most people when they hear AI or artificial intelligence, it either goes one way and we think Skynet or it goes the other way of powering data. But then there's this middle piece in between as Eli mentioned and each of you touched on as well is it's actually empowering something we do, right? We don't even know it's there, but it's doing something for us. Um, however, on the bigger scheme of things, artificial intelligence or AI is being placed in many different industries 
uh, and many different products, many different countries around the world doing different things. Would love to hear your opinions on kind of where we are with the state of AI. What is exciting and, and what's, you know, what's still to come? And Gary, let's, let's start with you um, as well. And you're on mute at the moment. Okay, so yeah, no, thanks, Kyle. So let's look at that, let's paint a picture. Look at our lives in a very simple way. The amount of information that's coming at each of us every day. And let's take a little bit of a problem. Let's look at email, for instance. Let's look at Google Drive, Dropbox Box. Think about how many email accounts each of us have here. Think about the Slack, the WhatsApp, the Telegram, et cetera. All that information that's coming at us is infobesity. And if we look at it, 1996, the total number of websites was 257,000. Each one of us here today has approximately 300,000 items within their own personal cloud. Now, how in the world are we gonna be able to address that information? And that number doubles every year. So we say this is around us all the time, you're right, the AI, but we have problems where we have too much data coming at us. In five years, there'll be 10 million items that each one of us have in our personal cloud. And I would be willing to bet every one of us in the last month has said, I know that file exists, but I can't find it. Why? I've either forgotten a location or forgotten the keywords. All of us, right? And so think about it. We are inundated with information and AI helps us. AI is an assistant. AI helps us make our lives better. And it's critical that we do something about it now because in another year, it's gonna be a problem, a pervasive problem that's not gonna go away. So those kind of productivity tools that are out there that are AI enabled are gonna help us. Rana, same to you. Um, anything to add further on that? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, you know, Gary's points. I think uh, there's some good points there. Uh, look, I mean, um, we talked about this last time. Um, my view is that AI, uh, the larger purpose and the larger adaptations of AI, uh, in, it's, well, first off, it's still in its early days, right? So we're, we're now st starting to see some points of inflection, but still very, very early days. And so the big value adds that we're seeing is around automation. And there's a, there's, that's, that's a proven use case. I mean, whether it is using a machine uh, to automate a task that is at a factory floor or automating something that say a contact center worker does on a day to day after he hangs up or she hangs up after a, with, a, with a client, you know, documenting or summarizing uh, or even sort of finding things to help a client specific minutia aspects of day-to-day uh, -day business processes that can be automated. So the larger spectrum of what we're looking at in terms of adaptation and implementation of AI is in automating those small specialized tasks and uh, streamlining the business processes. And we've seen that and it's it's been very, very prevalent. You, you'd see that um, in, in variety of different ways and some very high levels of maturity and implementation. Well, now that we're looking to, so that's, I'd say sort of like, you know, the first wave of AI has been in that um, and it's been pretty widespread, I'd say almost industry agnostics. I mean, you're automating things for doctors, similarly you're automating things for, um, you know, salespeople and similarly you're automating things for retail workers. And so there's, there's that. Uh, certainly, the element of uh, dealing with vast amounts of data is an essential, important uh, capability that AI brings to the equation. Um, so there's, there's stuff like that. Now, um, when we get to the next level, which is sort of, um, you know, you see that point of inflection and you're building additional capabilities on top of some of these core capabilities. Now you're looking at some advanced use cases, uh, which potentially are great investment opportunities for us as investors as well. And what I see is that there are sort of two spectrums of those solutions. One is solutions that, um, that, that, that focus on replacing the human quotient uh, for whatever, right? I mean, whether it's uh, for, from a purpose of uh, uh, minimizing mistakes uh, and making, a more, making for a more consistent experience, because you know, as humans, we're flawed. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a machine do something, it's gonna do it in a more repeated fashion. And so, or, you know, uh, 
you know, uh, or, or for some other purposes where, you know, the humans aren't available and you have to, you have to use some other technologies to do it versus a, a solution that uh, kind of deals with randomness where there wasn't a human capability to, uh, to, to begin with. And you, uh, you were kind of dealing with randomness. You either didn't have a solution or you were doing uh, using a solution that was very ineffective. Like, so for example, let me give you an example. There's many examples, but I'm just gonna pick this example. So um, every call that you, um, you know, put in to a contact center gets recorded. You've been told about that. You know, it's called being recorded for quality assurance. What happens to those calls? Well, um, there's just a ton of calls coming in. Everything gets recorded, puts in a database. Well, you're recording it for quality assurance and compliance, but how do you actually do it? That's randomized for the most part, right? I mean, you're, uh, there's no physically way that you could have a workforce that listens through every call. So you're randomly selecting a portion of those conversations and have some trained people listen to it, look for compliance, look for certain things, uh, dialogue delivery and other aspects of it. And so um, that's randomness, right? So if you have AI that can do 100% call coverage and lis listen for certain aspects of why there's a good call, bad call, uh, that's a game changer. So when you have solutions that sort of fit into that spectrum, whether that's in health tech or FinTech or any other ampl implementations of AI that replaces randomness with a newer, better way of doing things. I, I feel those are the ones which are going to see that way, ride that wave of point of inflection in terms of the next wave of AI solutions. And so I think I think those are the big trends that I see in terms of sort of going from, you know, uh, sort of uh, basic automation to now newer use cases that uh, the newer experiences that weren't possible. And those would be sort of the next things that we would see in the next 10 years. And that will be uh, not just important for us as investors, but for the consumers for the most part. I think, you know, you always got to keep that consumer lens in front of you, which is you now have these brilliant user experiences that, uh, that you just didn't have. You have the ability to talk to an entity that understands multiple languages, has vast amounts of data. It's a very personal service and capability. So it's not necessarily replacing a human. A human simply can't do that job. And it's not possible to have a human speak every language in the world. And so stuff like that, uh, which now weaves into our consumer experiences and uh, replaces certain missing pieces in our business processes that uh, deal with randomness, I think are going to be fantastic areas to look into for, within the next 10 years. Yeah, and I, I, Constantine, I wanna to come to you on that. I mean, you've been reading books since you were a child on this subject. So whether you dated yourself or not, I'm gonna call it out. Um, you know, how, what else to add to Rana's points? Cause I believe uh, there's, there's a lot there and there's a few things I want to go down, but before we go, I would love to get your further opinion on, uh, on the state of things. Well, I think that the state of the union is actually quite poor um, compared to the amount of money has been poured and amount of attention. First, there are two AIs, uh, which are very distinct. The classical AI, which is basically statistical analysis, which was developed around 40s, 60s, 70s and uh, now being repackaged and resold as AI. It's uh, very computationally easy and actually gives uh, results uh, which do the automation, remove the randomness. You can classify things, optimize, uh, do the um, improvement, but that was all already something we used uh, to put a machine on the moon. So uh, I'm not dating myself, wasn't around. Um, and then there is a second AI, which is a deep network uh, that um, is uh, quite impressive in what uh, it has been able to achieve and is also extremely impressive in what it has not been able to achieve. There is neither comprehension of what is going on nor a capability of um, improving it um, consequently year after year, which we would be able to understand. It is also highly computationally intensive. So uh, in a sense, we do not have enough uh, computing power um, in our everyday life to actually take advantage of that. 
we all talk about uh, self-driving cars, but uh, if you are able to catch an NVIDIA engineer and get him into a corner and ask, so tell me, he'll say that uh, even optimistic predictions require 10 times more computer power, which you have to put in a car. And we are about 10 years from that. So, um, the machine translation is still virtually unusable. You wouldn't ever trust uh, an actual contract translated by a computer. You would have a team of lawyers uh, on this. Uh, you would um, still not trust um, uh, the AI diagnosis by your doctor because um, uh, what doctor not doctors, but hospitals are interested in is not even the precision of your diagnosis, um, but basically how can they build it uh, in their ancient system. So there is a whole level of revolution with uh, exorbitant cost. Uh, we basically need to rebuild uh, the whole um, healthcare system to take advantage of that. Uh, and in France, we are failing completely. I am on a panel for uh, Health Data Hub, which aims um, to um, um, basically take information from hospitals and let researchers to put uh, AI on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hell because uh, everybody understands the danger. So nobody really wants uh, to be the one hanging on the tree once um, things um, deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Yet, of course, uh, I agree with the previous speakers that the automations um, uh, which AI can bring is uh, extremely useful and uh, shouldn't be overlooked. But I think that as we need to talk in a post-COVID um, uh, time, um, there seems to be that our ideas of what we actually need uh, slightly changed. And one more virus like this or second, third wave, uh, a bigger virus, and it will change dramatically. We will put more value on something completely different. Uh, for example, the first thought I had, is our agriculture going to survive this? If we, because I could see the confinement um, about a month before it, it was introduced. So I had to fill in uh, the freezer and that wasn't a nice feeling. I didn't yet contribute. Uh, will uh, there be any solution for that uh, that uh, can come from our brave new world from AI? No, that didn't happen. Will it contribute to the drugs or vaccines? That didn't happen. There are many efforts, but um, uh, looking at what people really need might not be just uh, helping them with a, a mail or a million of files which they might not actually need and are there just because nobody bothered to delete them so um I well think i think we i think on that and, and, yeah. and sorry to cut you off i want to make sure everyone gets a chance to, to comment in but thank you constantine i think you know with the the examples that gary gave those were kind of some of the the base examples right i, I think you're bringing up a good point is post this current era that we're in, we are gonna see a lot of new uh, opportunities come out of this when it comes to artificial intelligence. Because as we talked about, Rana, on our, our last show around this topic is we've got a huge amount of data that was just generated and collected in six months, globally in six months. Now, great, some of that data is skewed. There is a bias to some of that data, depending on where it was gone. But nonetheless, there is a huge amount of data that has been collected showing us new opportunities. And out of this, as we've seen in other times, we will find newer and newer opportunities as well. And, and Nicole, I wanna to come to you real quick and then Ron, I'll come back to you. I see you unmuted. Nicole, anything else to add? I saw both you and Henry shaking your heads uh, along the path there uh, as Constantine was, was mentioning a few items. Yeah, I mean, just that, you know, I'm absolutely in love with AI and I've also been disappointed. Um, so just to kind of echo some of the sentiments so far, um, I um, have seen just some really phenomenal use cases uh, during this time, during this pandemic. And um, 
one of my portfolio companies is called Nearshore Delivery Solutions, and they're based out of Mexico. It's a team that is, it's a phenomenal team creating chatbots. And the amount of customer service that their chatbots ha have needed to field has gone up 600%. So you have um, a lot of clients that are banks and it, those in the healthcare system that are fielding exponentially more questions than they ever have needed to because of the lack of, you know, um, ability to, to serve people. And, um, and the, the chatbots rocked and they only got smarter and better and could provide more solutions. And so that was one of those scenarios where you're like, whew, okay. You know, that took, that was scale, that everything was pushed there, right? And this was to replace a customer service experience. Um, and, and so, you know, it was, it was nice to see AI step up now, this company also addresses something that's important, um, which is bias in AI. And so they're looking at, and it's, you know, multilingual chatbots and they're looking at the bias. So making sure that, for example, financial products are, you know, um, brought up to all people. And, you know, in the past, we've had a challenge with that, with maybe products wouldn't be brought up to women or people from different regions. And um, that was that was a, a bias that really didn't need to be there, right? So I, I think there's some interesting things happening. Um, one other company that's stepped up to the occasion is called Gray Matter Analytics. And that's a female CEO running that company. They're providing um, healthcare uh, AI and um, taking, and they did a major pivot during COVID to address taking on all the amount of data and, you know, and, and making it meaningful um, to healthcare organizations and patients alike. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, I, I see us with a bit of a catapult forward um, and then a few steps back. And um, I always like to bring up my friend, Chris Payne's film, Do You Trust This Computer? Um, mm -hmm. It's on AI and it shows you the beautiful and the scary things about AI. So. Looking forward to hearing what other panelists have to say. Yeah, I, I, th I think you bring up a good point, right? We've uh, the the idea of a digitized world or digitization has been accelerated over the past six plus months, and some of that was already on that path. But whoa, um, we've we've already talked about that on pretty much every episode. But this is just furthering the point of how fast some of these things leapfrogged maybe where they were. But to your point the brakes had to be put on, right? Figure out what we really just went through, what really just happened, what kind of data is valuable or not as well. And Gary, I see you and, and Rana have, have unmuted. So Gary, I wanna to come to you first, Rana, and then Henry. Yeah, so I mean, I just wrote an article in Forbes actually today on uh, AI and, and uh, consciousness. And I also wrote one on digital transformation. And what we're talking about here, we're absolutely right. This world has changed in the last three months. Think about it just on Zoom. I remember what, five years ago when I was on Zoom and there were very, very few customers. What is four months ago were 30 million and there's over 300 million today. Think about it. So it has sped up for all of us. And you're right about, uh, I did a service chain optimization company, Click Software. I was part of that team, as I said, and that was to make service deliveries better with artificial intelligence. It's impacting all parts of our lives, medical, retail, et cetera. So the thing is, it's like in the beginning of the, 19, uh, the 20th century with electricity, right? People said, oh, why do I need to have this? It's not gonna really do it, it's dangerous. It'll kill an elephant. Well, look how much it impacted our lives. And where we are right now, we're on the frontier of this impacting every single thing we do, everything. And the thing is, you're right about it. So Constantine, in terms of where we are today, you're right about it in terms of being in its infancy. Maybe we've got the intelligence of a fly, but it's going to come. 
So mm -hmm. do we embrace it and make our lives better? There are a lot of challenges we have. And this digital transformation has taken us, look at us today. Here we are, you know, at our webinar online talking to us. Before it used to be, we'd have to be in Chicago. We'd all meet together. Now we're unifying the world in a completely different way. And so- We wouldn't be together. That's the thing. That? We wouldn't be together. This we group, there's together. no way you would put we this group together in Chicago in the beginning of summer. We're all over the place. Half of us are in the Bay. Much, that has united us together in an entirely different way. And the people that can take advantage of that in a good way and to make their businesses better, their lives better, are the ones that are going to win. And it's not going to go away in the near term, right? This thing is how do we be able to adapt and change, make money, and be successful in this new environment? Absolutely, Rana. I, I've, I keep saying I'm coming back to you, so here you go. It's all, all good. Um, no, I, I agree. Look, I mean, I think um, I think there's a few different ways to look at this, right? So, from a, a, what I feel is that when uh, when we talk about AI. Uh, the view that comes to mind is uh, largely deep tech biased, and uh, which is certainly a very exciting part of AI. But there's there's a lot more to it, and I see it very very prevalent, right? I see it very up close in terms of the companies I work with, uh, the companies that I've invested in, the companies that I'm have run and built. Um, it, it's in the minutia aspects of specific product experiences you're building, and it's it's very widespread. Like, so unlike say a specific product, it's very difficult to showcase AI, say in a booth, in a conference. Um, it's behind the scenes. It's certain aspects of optimization. It's certain core capabilities that you have in your engine. It's certain insights that you can generate. It's part of it is automation. Part of it is sort of, you know, uh, dealing with uh, bringing in some, some points of differentiation. And uh, so I feel it's come a long way. I mean, uh, you know, from an insider's view, I see it pretty much everywhere. I mean, any leading company that's out there that's building a specific experience has a piece of AI in there. So I'm actually fairly impressed with sort of how things have come together. These last three months, I mean, you look at, you know, Moderna and how it's sort of accelerating. I mean, the, the only reason they're in the game, I mean, they've had no track record in the past is, you know, certain differentiated approaches around sort of how they've done some gene sequencing and how they've accelerated the whole process of uh, getting to trials. It's purely AI based. And a lot of that is remains to be seen and hasn't happened yet. We'll see how they do it, but it will be some of those things will be game changers, right? In terms of sort of like we're on this platform that we're looking at, um, how to scale that from you know, 30, 40 million to 300 million, how to scale that without, you know, uh, without necessarily bringing your systems down. Uh, a lot of those core capabilities, the plumbings have been sort of built on certain aspects of AI that have led the company to capitalize on that growth. So some of these trends were there um, previously and now we're seeing acceleration of those trends and the early adopters, especially digital natives, uh, they have built sort of some of those building blocks and plumbing. They know how to deal with data. You need to have to, first important thing, right? I mean, I think Gary brought this up. You don't know how to deal with data, you're not gonna compete. Uh, so first thing, I mean, is this, it, that's just number one thing. And that's one big aspect that you have to do. Uh, how do you deal with it? How do you scale? How do you manage it? Then how do you build certain core competencies on top of it? And then you're building green differentiated abilities, right? Certain aspects of deep tech that are now really, really being prevalent. It's like, you know, here's something that uh, only a human can do. And now you have codified that into a software program and now a machine or a software system can do what a human could do. You know, whether it's uh, cognitive reasoning or whether it is, you know, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of spatial processing and sort of looking at sort of uh, form factors and data and trends or maybe even art uh, and, you know, doing some subjective reasoning. So those aspects, emotional intelligence, that's where we focus on behavioral AI and emotional intelligence. That are, I see sort of, you know, goes on top of, I mean, if you don't have the plumbings in place, if you don't know how to deal with data, if you haven't automated basic processes, um, if you don't have some basic uh, scaling issues taken care of, which is where AI has been helping for the last 10 years. And you've seen a lot of points of acceleration in the last, I'd say, uh, you know, for six months where um, the companies who were sort of putting that off, they're like, let's get on with it. Let's create a department. Let's get on. Let's think about those things. Next 10 years, those other technologies on the deep tech side are, have been in the works. They've been ready, but 
um, the consumption factor hasn't been there because you haven't had the ecosystem where they can't actually be consumed. And so when that comes together in the next few years, I think we'll really see a point of acceleration in terms of sort of how uh, some of these companies operate. Yeah. Well, it's not a buzzword, right? That's, that's not the, we're not at that point anymore. You know, go it's back. Not- uh, we were talking on, on the last show as well, about five years ago and, Nicole shaking her head as well at being here in the Bay Area about five years ago, you had people raising fund after fund after venture fund on the keyword of AI. Companies raising money on the keyword AI. There was no understanding of what AI meant in their company or what AI was going to do with their fund. It just was something that people were building on to get some kind of, you know, step ahead of the rest when really now they're all being called out about it or there's nothing that's happened. Um, so we're now here. I mean, as, as investors, how do you, you know, without uh, being, without otherwise saying it differently is how do you get around the bullshit? How do you get through the idea of, you know, as an investor looking at the diligence, looking at a company that's really doing AI because just putting AI in your pitch deck shouldn't be raising new capital anymore. You should be seeing how that's powering uh, you in some way are powering your application, doing something more for your users. So question for all of you, and I'll come around real quick for quick thoughts. As investors, how are you looking at companies building in AI and getting through the diligence and looking at the true ability that they have as artificial intelligence being applied? Samit, I see you, saw you on mute first. Yeah. Gary, I saw you second. It was a quick button uh, switch, but let's start with you, Samit, and then we'll, uh, we'll come around. Yeah, so the way I analyze any company for an angel investment is to look at the business model. So uh, my AI investments are spread across two different types of companies. One is the SaaS companies which have AI as the main engine. So they are building artificial intelligence, um, natural language processing and uh, you know into their SaaS product, a software as a service product where they're training the AI and then providing some services to Fortune 500 companies. An example of that is Commerce.ai, which has Walmart and Procter & Gamble and uh, you know, Coca-Cola as customers and many other Fortune uh, uh, 500 customers, analyzing brands and what, uh, you know, e-commerce is exploding. And so much is being talked about on Twitter and Amazon reviews and all sort of reviews all over the all, all over the spectrum um, about uh, how a particular brand is performing or how a particular brand's competitor is performing. So, so for brand managers to analyze uh, what next to build or how to improve brands or what is being talked about their brand, it's either you can have humans do that, which is traditional way, or you can have an AI do that because you have to now. The data is like doubling every few months now, the data. And so analyzing that, uh, you know, it's a great SaaS platform. They've built great marquee list of customers they're, they're having. And then, of course, on the chatbot side, you know, we had invested in a company called Kylie, which got bought by Directly. And Directly has uh, Microsoft and, you know, Airbnb and some other customers where uh, you have uh, bots, answering consumer questions. So it's again, natural language processing. Uh, we can uh, train um, um, a chatbot to, to answer common questions uh, by customers. And you know, a part of that can be automated. It's a, it's a low skill job, which can be automated. You know, and it's done in volumes around the world. Uh, so those are SaaS platforms, which are training AI to do uh, work which is cumbersome uh, was doing being done by humans e- either inefficiently or uh, you know just increasing the efficiency of the process. And then we have other set of uh, companies which are using AI to make their traditional hardware products better. A big example of that is Heliogen, which uh, I mentioned earlier where Bill Gates is uh, uh, an investor now. And uh, the, the company was incubated as Edison Microgrids uh, in Idea Lab by Bill Gross. Um, and th- they are now using 
computer vision and artificial intelligence and computation technology to align mirrors uh, so effectively and so precisely as the sun moves uh, through the day that they can point all these mirrors and heliostats into a, a, a small hole, which is a, as big a size of a, a basketball uh, hoop, which is generating energy more than 1,000 degrees, uh, you know, which was not possible before. And that kind of heat generation without using fossil fuels can literally be the next big revolution for climate for tackling climate change right. because and 75 I'm, I'm percent of it i'm with you so i'm, I'm gonna jump to henry because i want again i want to make sure everyone gets a chance how do you know as investors how are you looking at this from a diligence perspective because a company i can tell you right now i build ai you all believe it i could sell you i could sell it to you right now in 30 seconds how are you as investors looking at it from a diligence perspective understanding that there is AI technology being built in, whether it be NLP or others, and it's being leveraged correctly. And Henry, I want to start with you. Gary, I saw you unmute. Eli, I got, I got all of you coming. Don't worry. I'm seeing everybody just so you know. So Henry, go ahead. Well, first of all, it's all bullshit. It's not AI. There's no artificial intelligence today. That's, that's the first thing. So if you want to think about it correctly, change the name artificial intelligence to machine learning, to uh, data analysis, to whatever the hell you want. Just don't put the word intelligence. Everything I've heard today was about dealing with data. And I agree, dealing with data is a very big deal. There's a ton of data. I invested uh, 15 years ago in a company called Advanced Digital Forensics out of there in Virginia. It's doing a lot of work with law enforcement and others, and it's, and, and it tried to explain, and, and, and it finally, it took a while to explain the value of, uh, of um, uh, dealing with, with, uh, with uh, you know, huge amounts of data and doing um, uh, uh, proper uh, filtering and, 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 and getting rid of all the stuff that you don't want so that you can focus on what you want. That's been around for a very long time and processes have improved and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But today you don't have an intelligence. You have all sorts of tools for machine learning. Constantine explained everything. Uh, I don't have to get back into it. So when you go and look at a company that says we're doing artificial intelligence, the first thing you need to do is, okay, what are your processes? What are your algorithms? What are you trying to do? And the moment somebody tells you we do intelligence, blah, 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 they're full of shit. If they're going to tell you, okay, what we do is this data analysis and we uh, do uh, 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 sorting of data, we do, we do uh, uh, processing, we do uh, cleanup, we do, or we do um, NLP, we do we chatting, we do whatever with this kind of data. And these are our biases because this is how we learn. It's all about data machine learning where it learns and then it spews out the results of learning. There is a hardly any intelligence whatsoever. The only thing that surprised me once was this AlphaGo in one of the games, uh, the Go games, it went and did something tr truly unique in, 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 in the middle of the game where it found that uh, an area of the game where it was fighting the human was, uh, was getting stuck and it said, you know, I'm just going to open up another front. And this was very surprising because nobody had ever seen something like this happen before in a, in a game of Go. Fine. This stuff is very interesting. But right now, most of the stuff that's being done is pure data work and data analysis and understanding patterns. That's cool, but it's not intelligence. And if anybody, when you're doing your, 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 uh, your due diligence, tries to tell you different, then, hey, uh, it's, it's like, uh, uh, you know, you have, uh, you have a big claim and you need uh, 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 a, a, lot of, a, a lot of proof next to it to try to explain what you're doing because most of it is garbage. Gary, anything to, to add on to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I said when I, when I spoke earlier that it's about the size of a brain of a fly, right? But then the thing is, we want to be on this crane. We want to be moving forward with it. So 
The other thing is when I look at it and I've got a number of companies from security to healthcare, et cetera, that I'm involved in as co-founder, et cetera, I look at things like variational auto encoders, ladder networks, clusterization, sentiment analysis, and you're right about it. Do we, can we make some novel decisions out of that? It isn't all there today, but it's coming and it's coming very, very quickly, right? So do we wanna be in or do we wanna be out? Look at some of the technology. I, own a, I was a co-founder of Evo, one of the top workforce management AI companies with uh, David Yang out of Russia. And I mean, it wasn't easy. Four years ago when we got started, we talked about predictive insights, I did. And we were just on the cusp of the AI. It's going to take some time. That's all I have. All right. It's going to take some time. Got it. Eli. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Um, so I think it's quite surprising um, when a lot of companies come to us and they put, like you said, AI on the presentation, right? And, you know, they have nothing to back it. So the way we address it, um, you know, for right or wrong, we have them walk us through the process. You know, where is the AI being, you know, sort of implemented, embedded, and how does it function? And just like Henry said, most of the time it's just machine learning. And, you know, we have them make modifications. They do that themselves. But the fact is that even in 2020, their companies that are putting AI because they have some machine learning algorithms. And, you know, are they going to get funded? Who knows? But it is happening right now. But, but, but do, in, a, in a broader sense, you know, AI is just inevitable. Um, it is going to be a matter of survival. And the way that I, I think we have to look at it from an investor's perspective, and, you know, our view is not only as an investor, but also as an investment banker, because we actually have a very large uh, sort of set of stakeholders that we have to cater to. So we look at it from a business case perspective. And, you know, it's just like you have this tool and where does it make the most economic sense from a cost benefit analysis? And, you know, we can't really talk about AI in a vacuum. It has to be subject to a certain industry where you believe that the value of the AI is actually bringing the bottom line enhancement to the overall business. So we're seeing some of that coming into, you know, healthcare. Healthcare is a very big ticket item. Uh, the mistakes in healthcare can be pretty costly. And that's really one of the better use cases we see. Um, you know, from, a, from AR, VR perspective, when you sort of look at, you know, remote surgeries, you know, if you make one mistake, and you hit the wrong vein. I mean, it is pretty costly from a, from a lawsuit perspective. Of course, human death as well, um, or injury. But, but from, a, from, a, from a cost benefit analysis, you know, we're seeing um, you know, use cases in supply chain uh, where you actually have a lot of the demand coming in from online orders, right? So, you know, earlier somebody mentioned about Zoom going to 300 million users. So we're seeing the massive shift in the digitization and, and, and that's really where the supply chain, the route optimization, the load optimization. So a lot of the, the trucks, when they're, uh, when they're done delivering, they're back and they're either empty or they're half empty, right? The deadheads. So how do you sort of optimize that? Uh, one of my companies, ePallet, um, does the, um, the, the actual pellet level delivery versus truckload. So you have food banks, you have school districts that don't want, you know, a whole truckload of, you know, sort of uh, sunkissed. So they actually do it at pellet quantity, but they do utilize a lot of intelligence in there. But, but that's a, a good use case. Um, so I think really the takeaway is this. Um, you know, what is the business use case? Uh, we can't really talk about it in vacuum. And it is inevitable because the bigger players will have the tools and the resources necessary to deploy it and have this massive amount of data digestion, but also intelligence. Um, so it would become a matter of survival. So thank you. 
So, so then in that case, uh, to the whole group, what are, what are the investment opportunities in this space, whether it's AI or automation as a bigger picture? Where, where should investors or where are you paying attention to uh, in this uh, bigger picture as things are building? Because I think everyone's mentioned at this point, this is not a one year, this is not a two year, this is not a three year build. This is a large, long time frame type build. This is something that you're going to be looking at making investments in and holding for five, 10 plus years and five being still a little early. We're talking 10 plus years. So where are the opportunities today that you guys are looking at as investors um, to add on to Eli? So Constantine, I saw you come off mute first. I'm going to go yeah. to you and then Rana and we'll come around. Well, I talk first because I'm not a real investor like the rest of you. I can mostly invest my time and effort. And um, so recently, a hundred billion company wanted me to run their AI operations. So I looked, what are they? And they were surveillance. So I thought that no. But uh, the principle, I think uh, here should be the principle of the gold rush. And uh, that is, you should invest in shovels. Uh, that the companies who facilitate AI will uh, earn much more than the companies uh, who want to optimize trucks. Mm -hmm. There are two main reasons there, and one is uh, just uh, P equals and P is still not true. So there, there is complexity which cannot be resolved um, it, AI, even deep learning, is not a miraculous algorithm. It still confirms to the rules uh, of mathematics. So uh, there are things which you can just uh, cannot find an optimal solution. And every company who hasn't been using the tools which they have, the statistical analysis and logistic regressions, whatnot, uh, for the last 40 years already went bankrupt. So uh, most of business processes are optimized and uh, it uh, has a chance of become a sort of a self-supporting system. And if there is gold or not uh, in there, it um, is not very clear, but people who sell shovels will certainly be on top. I saw many heads shaking on that. So I think you're onto something there, Constantine. Rana, to you. Yeah, look, I mean, from an from a investor mindset, um, my, my, my view is generally, I tend to gravitate more towards, like if you're looking at this, the current landscape, um, I'm more interested in um, business models that are seeing points of, you know, they're capitalizing on acceleration versus uh, they're pivoting post COVID. And um, yeah, not to say that the pivots are not gonna be valuable, but there are some general trends. And so what, what we're seeing is there are some models, there are some business opportunities that were kind of already on its way. And now with the wind on the back, um, it's going to take there. I mean, you gotta have to think subjectively in terms of whether you believe in those trends or not. And some of those are fairly obvious, but uh, that's what I would do. I mean, the ones I believe in, I'm investing in those areas. Outside of that, um, the investment thesis uh, around uh, investing in a, in a you know, in, a, in any genre is for me very similar. Um, I mean, one, I mean, the most important thing is the, 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 the largeness of the opportunity, which is whatever you're trying to solve, how, how, how much do I believe in it? Is, is it an opportunity that is big enough? Because not every opportunity is worth investing in. And the second is what are your unfair advantages? And for me, that's where kind of AI or machine learning comes in at times, which is you know, if somebody comes in and says, I'm solving this problem, it's really worth solving, it's massive, it's really big. Uh, the question is, why you? And if they can come in and say, we have had this breakthrough, we have had these abilities, or we do it differently. Oftentimes, AI is weaved in there, which is we have certain abilities, we've had certain capabilities that nobody else has. That's interesting, right? I mean, that's interesting. And that's where you go in. And oftentimes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's just a differentiated approach. And oftentimes there are actually technological breakthroughs where they have abilities that, uh, that they have developed, which others don't have. And so if now you're going to take those unfair advantages and go into solving that bigger problem and everything else checks out, um, I, think, I think there was a great investment opportunity. So for me, it's fairly simple. That's all I look at. Um, 
and um, yeah, of course, um, you know, devil's in the details, but keeping it high level. Gary. Yeah, so from my perspective, it's, it's pretty simple. So we're taking companies on the GSD side. We look at companies that have really dominated their space in a particular region and are ready to go global that in areas where we have interest. So I have an aging in place uh, company that's uh, interesting. We've got a, a company that workforce management, as I said, Eva, which I co-founded, uh, interested in that. Of course, now with the pandemic, right? With uh, Who would have thought six months ago that almost everybody would be working remotely or 70% of the population. So those kind of things are really compelling. and. Then on the other side of it, technologies to be able to support. So we've got a company that is in uh, security where we've got camera for COVID, that kind of thing. And this has been doing this for some time. We got like 50 some thousand cameras deployed already. So those kind of where there's an issue and you can make a mark today and grow your business later. So uh, again, it's, you know, I, I look at the AI, how sophisticated the team is and can re we take operational roles in the company? So I either become the CEO, chairman, uh, president, you know, some operational role in the company. And that's how we do it. So we jump in, look for a compelling team, look for interesting technology, and look for a sector that's really ready to explode and grow. It's me. Yes. So analyzing any businesses uh, from a venture capital or an angel investing point of view is very similar. How will this team take this to a billion dollar? Uh, valuation or exit or, and you know what are they building what are the problem they are solving what is the business model gross margins net margins uh, is the team willing to stick to the idea what initial traction do they have uh, any marquee customers any intellectual property any patents you know any moats created uh, those are standard across AI and non AI but there are because of AI and because of these com computational uh, abilities created by NVIDIA chips and, you know, the enablers, the shovels, as we are talking about, uh, there are some new business models and technology uh, and products coming out, which are, which were not existent maybe, you know, 10 years ago, like night scope security robots. These are self-driving machines, which are patrolling malls, casinos, um, uh, you know, corporate campuses, uh, they are 24 by 7 operating, replacing or enhancing human security guards' capabilities. Um, they can see, hell, hear, smell, uh, detect if there's any fire burning or you know any heat generating around. So tons of sensors, tons of AI, tons of machine learning. Um, and they navigate themselves, um, you know, and self-charge themselves providing security mm -hmm. services, making uh, America more uh, safer place. So those mm -hmm. models would not exist without, you know, computer vision and so many other technologies uh, which are now existing and the computation power that is now existing. So yeah, new business models and new products are coming up only because of this uh, machine learning and AI. So those are good opportunities to invest in, especially if there's intellectual property patents uh, being secured great business and gross margins are there scalable to worldwide or multi-billion dollar opportunities and yep. this uh, you know fits the business model fits the virtue venture capital model yep thank you Nic nicole same same to you well i mean in terms of doing due diligence i now rely on my new friends constantine and gary and <laughs> Anna and the team right to look under the hood i'm always looking at you know, what is the go to market? What is the business model and business use case that makes sense currently? And I completely agree with you, Rana. You know, you, it's, it's, it makes so much more sense to look at, you know, businesses where the wind is at your back that they've already identified a need, um, you know, for to leverage machine learning and, and data analytics. And they're doing so, you know, right now um and what does that lead to in the future and is that scalable um 
And then it comes down to looking at, you know, who are all the partners in the space that are, are making this possible. You know, we're, we're at the whim a lot of times of the, you know, IBM Watson and, you know, um, Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, you know, all of those guys too. Um, and how this all works and, and, and scales. Um, and I also like the investing in shovels um, because, you know, right now it is, it's a, it's a bit of a haul and, um, you know, I still like the autonomous vehicle space and things like that, but I just don't see that, you know, really happening and coming to fruition for, for some time. And I'm invested there, you know, but I'm invested there with a future eye to, you know, what's going on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, oh, cool. I'm just going to stay in it and, you know, looking at the go-to-market opportunities. That's what I can do best. Quick question for you. Um, focusing on go-to-market strategy as companies are coming to you in this space, um, whether that be as, as Henry mentioned in, building something with machine learning behind it, or they are a company that's using uh, uh, the idea of intelligence being built, data, et cetera. What kind of advice do you have for early stage companies in, in terms of their go-to-market strategy? Well, I mean, I almost don't even want to look at companies that aren't considering machine learning as part of their model. Um, just because I, I think we all need to leverage it in, in different ways. And it, it just depends on the industry and, and the business use case. Right. Um, but for, for customer service and, you know, supply chain, uh, tracking and, and management and, you know, um, data analytics, you know, the branding example was interesting, you know, all of those just, you know, make a ton of sense. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at, you know, what does this truly add to value, value? What value does it add to the stakeholders? you know, um, or are they just using the words machine learning, artificial intelligence, which has been absolutely rampant. And unfortunately it's given a, a, a bad name to the space because you just don't know what's false and what's puffed. And so that's why I literally do turn to other investors to take a look um, under the technology hood for me. So, so with that being said, thank you, Nicole. So, so we're, we're at that hour. Uh, it's also partner Monday um, for most that are maybe on uh, East coast, West coast time here in the States. So uh, I do want to be sensitive of everyone's time and very appreciative of all the insights thus far. So we'd love to go around and get everyone's closing thoughts at how they're looking at uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and the like, what's to come and what's got you excited. Um, and then where can everyone find you? And unfortunately, we didn't have enough time today to get to VR and the Oasis and what is to come with virtual reality. But we will have that back here on a, another show early this week, if not next week. So Samit, we will come back for you on that. Do not worry. But uh, let's start with you, Samit. Closing thoughts on, on this topic today, where things are, where things going, what has you excited, and then where everyone can find you. So quick closing thoughts. Uh, and then we've got an exciting topic uh, coming up here in just a few minutes. Uh, yes, I think all, all the points mentioned are very relevant. The data is increasing. Uh, it's multiplying at a very, very fast pace with video and, uh, you know, customer reviews and Twitter and Facebook. And so uh, we need a computational ability and uh, help of technology to deal with this sort of data. And there are a lot of opportunities in that space. And then making existing hardware products smarter. Again, a lot of computation using, you know, uh, natural language processing, uh, computer vision, and uh, machine learning, of course, you know, all these uh, technologies absolutely relevant. They're making our lives more smarter every day. Uh, more safer, so lots of opportunities in the in Thank you. in the space. Thank you. Where can everyone find you online? Um, I'm at grotu.com. Uh, uh, you know, you can uh, visit the website. Uh, 
and LinkedIn is the best way to connect me uh, with me. And uh, I'm pretty active. I respond to most messages on my LinkedIn. So you can connect Perfect. and DM me. Awesome. Thank you. Constantine, same to you. Quick closing thoughts and where can everyone find you? So uh, my closing thought says that uh, I'm actually highly optimistic uh, about uh, the future use of it. Uh, that uh, while the gold rush was over, soon we found another use for gold in our electronics and it uh, remained um, relevant for uh, at least the next century. And I hope that it will happen with AI once um, the rush goes away. And uh, LinkedIn is a good way to contact me if you like to talk about any. Yeah. Wonderful. Henry, closing thoughts and where can everyone find you? Well, I'm very excited about uh, the reduction in data needs for uh, proper machine learning. As time goes on, uh, we're starting to need less and less data or uh, alternatively, we can uh, generate um, uh, data that is not, is not real, but it will really help uh, the machine learning. And that should, should, quotes, help with the bias and all sorts of problems that we've got uh, with AI today uh, or machine learning today. So that, that gets me very excited that uh, soon we're going to have some, uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of improvements in, uh, in, in, uh, this, uh, in, in this field and machine learning in, uh, in different areas. And uh, you can find me online. I mean, my name is pretty unique, so just search for it or go on LinkedIn. You can find me. Wonderful. Eli. Well, um, I think the most important thing we look at is really the, uh, the visionary domain dominance, we call it VDD. So we look for to sort of the, the team members that actually understand and have deep domain expertise. And they're looking to solve uh, the problems to create actionable intelligence. And, you know, we work with them and we work with them to uh, build an AI machine learning mostly and and really surround them with the right amount of talent pool that's easier to do than to find the domain expertise. The harder part is really understanding what is the problem at the fundamental level and what does the solution look like um, a lot of times when it's only a tech heavy team they believe they know the answer but they don't really have the expertise. They have people on the board of advisors. That just doesn't cut it. So we need to see the actual domain expertise as part of the core founding team. And then if the, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the technical angle is there, that's great. If not, we can, we can help bring that in. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the business case? What is the actual cost benefit analysis of delivering that solution and what is the actionable intelligence worth to the customer and are they willing to pay for it? Have signed paying customers. Thank you. And where That's people can find me uh, is Eli, uh, you know, is Eli Jawad Ansari. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and, um, you know, um, Elliot Bausted 1828com Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nicole. Um, oops, sorry, barking dog, um, working from home. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm excited to see um, some of these e technologies accelerate, um, especially in the world of, of customer service and how they're getting smarter and smarter. So um, just kind of digging the, the chatbot world right now quite a lot. And just, um, you know, I think it, it is, it's so important to just make sure that the business use case makes just 180% sense. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited about where we're going and I'm definitely going to track with all everyone on this panel. So thanks for sharing all your insights. Um, and to stay in touch with me, my firm is Outfront Solutions. So it's www.outfront.com.
Thought Solutions. And uh, LinkedIn's a great place to stay in touch. And um, please remind me how we met because I get a lot of inquiries. So, thanks. That's, that's always good. So to you, our audience as well, make sure you, uh, if you reach out to Nicole or any of us, make sure you do mention VCTV. Uh, Gary, to you, closing thoughts, where can everyone find you? You're on mute. Good, sir. So we, um, you know, I'm really looking for incredible teams. I'm looking for uh, wherever they're located. Our job is to really package them together and take the AI and make sense of it. I'm looking for technical co-founders all the time. So folks that are a lot smarter than I'll ever be that um, really have the passion to go global. So there's three things that I'll, I'll leave your thoughts with. I look for intergenerational teams because sometimes we put a emphasis on the youth when in reality we need people that have the experience that have done it before. I look for multicultural teams. So I've been a proponent, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of folks, women, um, uh, I have a board member from the NAACP is on my board, uh, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm really into multicultural teams. But the other thing is regionally diverse. I like people to pull together from all different regions because they have different insights. I believe that's how you make a really powerful team. And I believe that this is, this is the time. This is the new electricity. And we've got an opportunity to make a little dent in the universe, as Steve used to say. So let's do it. And GSD, so GSD, let me say GSD Venture Studios, gsdvs.com. That's my uh, company that uh, is our venture studio and also on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to talk and help. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Rana. Thank you, yeah. Gary. All right. So I, I think my closing thoughts are just simply, um, you know, sort of underscoring the point that we're going through some incredible times. There's some seismic shifts happening in the landscape and the ecosystem. And um, my thoughts are that now's the time to really, really learn and pay attention of what's happening around you. The risk is to be too operationally focused on a day to day and lose these opportunities that are presenting, uh, pre presenting ahead of ourselves, whether, whether that's from an investor standpoint or from an entrepreneur standpoint, um, now's the time to connect the dots. And there's gonna be a lot of differing opinions. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, debate around a lot of aspects, but um, once you connect the dots, there's some trends that are very, very stark and very clear. And therein lies the investment opportunities. It's almost a no brainer. It's almost a no brainer. And um, I mean, you're building our portfolios for the next 10, 15 years. And uh, it, you know, so there's, there's uh, lot to pay attention to and that's the main point um at this point is that there's a lot a lot a lot of fantastic time fantastic time to plan for the next 10 years and uh you can find me on my web page ranagujral.com that's the best way to do it now linkedin as well but usually the messages on linkedin get get lost there's just many that come in so web page would be the best and uh let me know how i can help Wonderful. Thank you all again today for, for dedicating some time on Partner Monday. Really appreciate it. I know you've joined from all around the world. So for some of you, good evening. For some of you, good morning. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. But again, to all of our investors, thank you very much for all the insights, the time, and the experience that you shared with us today. To our live audience, thank you very much for tuning in. If you like today's episode, click the subscribe and the thumbs up. We have tons of resources that everyone has been chatting me. I will put out on YouTube a little later today. As everyone mentioned, we are available on social media or on our respected websites, company pages. Do reach out. These are all investors that want to talk to you if you're building in these spaces and potentially VR, but we didn't get a chance to get to that today. So do reach out to each and every one of us for follow-ups as well. And thank you to Elena, to the entire LAO Token team, as always, for bringing us together on another edition of VCTV. I'm Kyle Ellicott. To our investors, we're going to say goodbye. We're going to take a quick pause for just a moment as we've got an exciting keynote in the fintech blockchain space that's about to come up here in just a moment. So to our investors, thank you very much. Everyone have a great day. To our audience, stay on. We'll be switching cameras here in just a moment. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Kyle. Thanks, Elena. Be well. Thanks, everybody.
All right, Adrian, the man of the hour. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kyle Licott, your host for, again, another edition of VCTV. This time, we're back again talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is fintech and blockchain. We've got one of the premier experts from around the world joining us today to give us a little bit different uh, conversations focus this time a, a keynote discussion around the importance of patents in the crypto and digital currency world that have been issued during this time of of COVID and our lockdown in general uh, and what matters or what may not matter uh, in the future. So joined by the great one and only uh, Adrian uh, of Faster Capital. Adrian, welcome back to VCTV and thank you, Elena. LA Token for bringing us both together uh, and to your audience. Anytime as Adrian's talking, by the way, if you have questions, comments, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll do my best to bring them up uh, if we can during uh, the keynote, if not uh, at the end. So Adrian, with that being said, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kyle. And uh, thank you very much the team at uh, LA Token for making these meetings uh, possible. Um, I had uh, a little challenge uh, at the beginning of the, the previous panel because um, my, uh, my screen froze, my keyboard uh, stopped working. So I, I said, okay, uh, while the other people are speaking, I can uh, re uh, reset, basically, I can restart the laptop. And uh, the, the restart was very slow. So I took the tablet from my small daughter from the five-year one so I stayed here with that. And after that, fortunately, everything went there because I said, okay, I have on the laptop, I have the, the presentation for the keynote. So if I can pivot during the, the, the general talk, it will be impossible to do it when I have the keynote. So um, this is something which it's very difficult for artificial intelligence to do, I believe. <laughs> so uh, um, yes, it is. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, uh, um, I will have a presentation, a, key or a keynote or a masterclass presenting the details about the, the, the most important, I, I believe, uh, patents for cryptocurrency and digital currency. Uh, it, it, it's uh, happening that they issued during the lockdown, basically, so between March and, and May. All of them were, uh, were created way before that. But uh, as a coincidence, they were issued during those uh, March, April, and, and May. And I would like to, to make a connection between what we spoke before and the importance of the patents, because um, we need to, to, to understand why those patents are important important those patents are important and as a sales and a marketing person i have a certain mindset of course i used as an excuse for many years that i'm not a technical person but in the meantime i did everything i could and i would like to to advise to uh, everybody having the same bullshit excuse to find a way to to upgrade the technical background because otherwise um, sooner or later, we will be out of the of, out of the market. And having this background as a, a sales and marketing person, um, I'm involved in, uh, in also in selling digital and information products. And uh, one of the questions before was, okay, where we, where are we looking for the opportunities in these markets? And of course, the the, the classical uh, answer and uh, I'm falling also on that. I'm looking at the technical innovation, if I can understand that technical innovation and I, I can do until a certain level, I'm looking at the team and at the possibility of mass adoption. But while we were on, uh, on a discussion earlier, I said, why not touching uh, another approach, which uh, makes very, very good sense and is extremely important. Back in the day when when we started to sell information products, and I like to use associations because we adults, the learning process, we are learning, associating what um, uh, we know with what we don't know. 
And sometimes the, the school, the formal school, makes the huge mistakes associating what we don't know with something we also don't know. So uh, it, it's impossible to, to advance. So previously, when the information, when the selling of information products started, we had some main markets. These were health, wealth, and relationship. The same way when we had uh, toothpaste in shops, I believe it was only one brand. When we had razors in, in shops, mm, the same things. Maybe we had one brand or, or two brands. If we're talking about blockchain, fintech, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, let's take these examples. These are like health, wealth, and relationships. They are the markets, the important markets. These markets being at the beginning, by, uh, by developing them slowly, slowly, we will start seeing what are called the niches. And after that, the, the sub niches. And if we take the, the previous example as health, one of the niche in the health market is healthy eating. And one of the uh, sub niches in, in uh, healthy eating is let's say paleo diet. And all those niches and especially sub niches, because it's very available, especially in the global, in the global market um, to, to start um, uh, in, in a certain niche to target a certain type of customer, right? So to be able to have uh, as fast as possible some clients and to generate revenue. And so many startup founder, founders, they don't look at, uh, they don't see uh, generating revenue or having some clients as a priority. And if we are seeing the new niches and the new sub niches in this market, we are talking about blockchain, fintech, artificial intelligence, and the virtual reality. The, the real extraordinary big opportunities will be to find the category winners in these niches and sub niches. This is the methodology you can, uh, you can, uh, you can test it will be worth the effort of doing this research in the, the next years, I believe. So I wanted to use that just to, to make a bridge between um, the discussion before with the esteemed panelists and what I want to do now. So um, I need to share my screen. I will kindly ask uh, uh, Elena to support me to be, to be sure that I can share the screen. Okay, one second. To be sure that everything is okay. It should work. Is it working, Adrian? One second. Okay, so. I'm... We can see it. Yes, beautiful. It's okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, fortunately, because I uh, resetted my laptop uh, earlier, it's okay now. Otherwise, it would have been a disaster. <laughs> so, uh, the <laughs> for real. Um, by the way, regarding disasters at home, I have two internet providers. So if something happens, to be able to 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 switch because I'm so afraid of uh, uh, these impossible things happening. So the presentation will be about the three most interesting patterns in the crypto and digital currency space this year, and I'm talking about Visa, Radatech, and Microsoft, and of course why they matter for the future. I strongly believe that this industry is driven by innovation and we can have fabulous um, uh, pitches and great marketing reports and uh, pitch decks and all this slang, but many 
of those speeches are just uh, marketing sales letters. They are sales letters selling the idea to investors and to other stakeholders. And um, sometimes they need to, to contain the right keywords, as we've discussed before. You have to see their fintech, you have to see their blockchain, but the fundamentals are more important than ever. And if you are looking at everything around us, even uh, the, the mobile phones, even the electricity, even uh, the cars and everything, some, uh, some uh, uh, men and women dedicated many years from their lives and, and many teams worked on finding new ideas, new ways on, on doing things. And of course, to protect those ideas, they registered patents. So uh, a patent is basically a mirror of innovation. It is something which was not done before. And uh, by, by filling a patent and by being accepted, it's like a, a signature on something which has the potential to change the future. Um, for many years, I didn't know that, for example, uh, the the business model of Airbnb is patented. Um, I I thought that okay, it's something uh, normal to to rent rooms in in uh, in other people's houses. So um, right as we speak, there are more than five thousand cryptocurrencies. I believe the number is around seven thousands, and this is growing. So this industry is in the mass awareness phase going towards mass adoption. There is a big difference between mass awareness and mass adoption. We are uh, speaking all the time about, okay, uh, Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum and, uh, and other coins are mass adopted. But at the end of the day, none of them is considered the, uh, the main um, digital coin which uh, is adopted everywhere, none of them. And we need to make an effort right now. And uh, what LA Token is doing is part of mass awareness. So the, the more people, the better will find out about digital currencies, about cryptocurrencies, even about the startups world, about the VC funding, because this education is more important than the kind of education we are receiving from uh, uh, high schools, faculties, and many of the MBAs. Because uh, we are living in a new world and what happened during this beginning of the pandemic period, because nobody knows exactly how things will evolve in the next six to 12 months, from this point of view, at least until a vaccine will, uh, will, um, will be discovered and used. So this process is accelerated. While the game changers can be counted with the number of fingers, we all have, we all have most of them. We all have, sorry. Most of them are finding a lost battle because they don't bring any, any innovation. I'm talking here about uh, many of the tokens and coins, besides generating pump and dump movements, and the majority will die during the next few years if they are not in coma already. So there are many uh, tokens, many coins, which are just copycats. They don't have uh, projects. They are not backed by real projects. They are not fighting from innovations. They don't want to change the world or to change an industry. And the, the evolution of humanity was based, and it is based on breakthrough and on breakthroughs. And now we are talking about technological bre breakthroughs. When I look at any coin or digital asset, because digital assets are the new uh, thing, there, there are a few elements I take into consideration. And these are deal breakers, in my opinion, and should be for many investors. First, the team. If there are any innovation and the potential of mass adoption, if not worldwide, at least in a niche industry or a certain demographics. In one of the, the previous uh, events, it was, um, it, it was a coin with uh, um, a wide distribution in the MLM industry 
and it was related to selling healthy products. And they had a beautiful business model. And basically, they had an ecosystem working very well and a coin which was adopted during the ecosystem and everything made sense there. Very cool project. One of the things that I'm looking lately at uh, are the pat patents issued in this space. One of the reasons is that, uh, as I said before, I'm upgrading all the time my, my technological uh, background, not to say that uh, I'm an economist and I can't look at, uh, at technology because if I don't do that, basically I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm out of the market. So, these are technological innovations that are protected. And we all know that this industry, the industry of uh, crypto and digital currency, will grow through innovations and breakthroughs. And as a coincidence, during March to April 2020, I believe March to May, so uh, in a span of three months, late April, beginning of uh, May, the most important patents were issued by Visa, Radatech and Microsoft. So I took some notes of uh, these patents at, and, and at the end you will find a link in an article where you can also find all the links to these patents. But of course you can find them very easy if you are uh, searching on Google. Visa cryptocurrency patent filling. The United States Patent and Trademark Office published in May a patent application entitled Digital Fiat Currency, filled by Visa International Service Association on November 8, 2019. The filling is for a fiat-linked cryptocurrency system using a private permissioned distributed ledger platform. It describes a central computer, its responsibilities and key roles of the system central entities, validating entities, redeeming entities, and users. A central entity may be a central bank, which regulates a monetary supply, the document details. Validating entities are blockchain nodes, which may be peers, such as banks. Redeeming entities may accept the physical currency for exchange for digital fiat currency, such as an ATM or a bank branch location. The central entity computer generates the digital currency that is recorded on a blockchain and may determine that a particular digital currency should be added to or removed from the blockchain. According to the fillings abstract, the filling further explains that the payment ecosystem may become 100% digital and cash may be removed from the markets in a frictionless manner to improve the payment ecosystem. You see many, uh, many governments and even um, big companies talking about cashless society. We already see shops by uh, by Amazon where you just have to to uh, to enter there to make uh, uh, the shoppings, and all the transactions will be done automatically uh, without cash or even without payment cards. So the trend is towards cashless society. Uh, idea because if we are looking at the trends, one of the trends, a very important trend, the world is going uh, towards that is a cashless society. And Visa's patent uh, is supporting this direction. And we all know that uh, I believe everybody has a card with, uh, with the Visa logo on it. So it's, it's a huge deal. Users may hold digital currency with the same denomination as the local physical currency. It also notes that once the digital fiat currency is issued, a user or bank may transfer the digital currency from wallet to wallet or store the digital currency on a smart card and transfer the smart card to another entity. A consensus mechanism has not been chosen for the system's blockchain. The consensus mechanism may vary depending on the protocol implemented. Some example consensus mechanisms are proof of stake, Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms and crash fault tolerant algorithms, the filling details. Other mechanisms 
explored include a copy of Ethereum, Hyperledger fabric, and zero knowledge proofs. A Visa spokesperson was quoted by Forbes as saying, each year we seek patents for hundreds of new ideas. While not all patents will result in new products or features, Visa respects intellectual property, and we are actively working to protect our ecosystem, our innovation, and the Visa brand. So Visa is a huge deal. So if they are publishing such a patent, I will, I will uh, study it. Even if I uh, have that excuse that I'm not a technical person, at least I will be able to understand half of it. The, the language and the slang is very, but if uh, there are some words which are um, uh, foreign languages, just search on Google because this information is available everywhere. It's exactly what I'm doing to, to uh, cut my uh, uh, bullshit excuses, sorry for the B word. The next patent is a radar tech patent protecting radar technology and cloud coin. The United States Patent and Trademark Office officially issued the patent protecting radar technology and the next gen digital currency cloud coin. A method of authenticating and exchanging virtual currency is used to permit secure ownership of virtual currency and manage financial transactions. The method is performed by a system that includes a user computing device and a plurality of remote servers. The user computing device stores an unverified certificate, which is used as currency. The plurality of remote servers is used to authenticate the unverified certificate and aid in transferring ownership of the unverified certificate. To do so, each remote server executes an authentication process for the unverified certificate and sends either a pass status or a fail status to the user computing device. The user computing device executes an assessment process for the unverified certificate based on the pass statuses and fail statuses received. Authentication information related to the unverified certificate is then updated on the user computing device and each remote server that return the past status. The network of distributed, decentralized and independent servers described in the patent is what we now call radar, redundant array of independent detection agents. The present invention relates generally to methods of managing virtual currency and the related transactions. More specifically, the present invention is a method of authenticating and exchanging virtual currencies that prevents counterfeiting and theft. Before discussing about the third patent about Microsoft, just a um, um, few basic ideas for non, uh, non techies. Uh, the radar technology is faster than blockchain and even faster than Visa. And at this moment is the fastest payment system in the world. Still not, not many people heard about it um, um, more people heard about uh, CloudCoin, which is one application of Radar. But if you remember what I saw, what I said at the beginning, look inside of those new markets like uh, uh, FinTech, blockchain, even post-blockchain is a new market developing, artificial intelligence, virtual reality and others. Look at the niches and the sub niches which could become the next big thing and the players who are building projects there. So this is a very good example of uh, uh, niche and sub niche and a project which a huge potential of adoption in the future. And the third one, everybody knows about Microsoft these days. Um, Microsoft patents new cryptocurrency system using body activity data. I was blown away when I saw this. So I said, okay, um, um, can, I, uh, um, can I mine something if I'm moving my fingers or I don't know, let's see. Microsoft has patented the cryptocurrency mining system that leverages human activities, including brainwaves and body heat. 
when performing online tasks, such as using search engines, chatbots, and reading ads. <clears throat> a user can solve the computationally difficult problem, um, one second, unconsciously, the, the patent rates, almost 100% percent sure about that. Microsoft Technology Licensing, the licensing arm of Microsoft Corporation, has been granted an international patent for a cryptocurrency system using body activity data. The patent was published by the World Intellectual Property Organization in March. The application was filled on June 20 last year. So if you ask me how these patents were published during the same period, I can't explain, but this is the reality. And maybe it means something. Human body activity associated with a task provided to a user may be used in a mining process of a cryptocurrency system. The patent reads, adding as an example, noting that the method described may reduce computational energy for the mining process, as well as make the mining process faster. The patent details, the patent describes a system where a device can verify whether the body activity data satisfies one or more conditions set by the cryptocurrency system and the word cryptocurrency to the user whose body activity data is verified. If you ask me, just to, to, to make a, a break from the uh, technological um, um, slang, uh, one of the dreams we have is to, to we as human, is to make um, many things during the same time. We call it multitasking, but usually multitasking is um, is a dangerous thing. But uh, Anthony Robbins, which is my, uh, who is my favorite coach, and uh, he, he has a theory called net time, no extra time. Meaning that, let's say, if uh, you have this excuse that you are not technical person, you are not a technical person, but you are going to gym, and if you if you uh, run on a treadmill, instead of uh, listening to music or something else, you could digest uh, this type of content to upgrade your technical knowledge while you are doing the workout. And this strategy is called net time, no extra time. So basically you have a time slot and you do two things. One of them is you are training your body and the next is you are you are um, upgrading your technical uh, 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 technical knowledge. And one thing I see here is that you could mine some cryptocurrency during this time, which is pretty cool from Microsoft. Different types of sensors can be used to measure or sense body activity, body activity or scan the human body, the patent explains. They include functional magnetic resonance imaging, scanners or sensors, electroencephalography sensors, near-infrared spectroscopy sensors, heart rate monitors, thermal sensors, optical sensors, radio frequency sensors, ultrasonic sensors, cameras, or any other sensor or scanner that will do the same job. The system may reward cryptocurrency to an owner or task operator for providing services such as search engines, chatbots, applications or websites offering users access for free to paid contents like video and audio streaming or electronic books or sharing information or data with users, the patent details. What I saw because it, it's, it's a coincidence, but I come back to this idea that uh, uh, those, the publishing of those patents happened during lockdown when uh, um, some people were very, uh, very uh, busy watching, uh, watching movies and other people were busy uh, pushing things, you know, and uh, entrepreneurship and investing because investing is, uh, is powering the entrepreneurship. These are the things which uh, are, are moving the world into a better direction. If you, if you uh, stay and just watch, watch movies, there is one thing, but if you use that time to push such projects and to push yourself, the result will be different. Of course, we all like to, to uh, 
uh, watch movies from time to time, but uh, the majority of time would have to be invested uh, here. If you are watching this presentation, you are on the on the good side because this is the 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 way to advance. So to to uh, expose yourself to new information, and uh, I congratulate you. So. Um, as a conclusion to this uh, uh, keynote, the lockdowns associated with the COVID-19 pandemic have forced the digitalization and the crypto and digital currency space proof to be pandemic proof. This is extraordinary. It's an industry which uh, can't be stopped. So I'm looking forward to the future of this young but paradigm changing industry. And uh, here are some details if you want to get in touch with me if you have any questions i'm very happy to help and to answer this is my linkedin uh, skype uh, telegram and here you can find the medium.com slash coin cruncher the the newest article is this one um i i wanted to add a friendlier link but you can find it if you are search on google or on medium in this article you can find also links to um the three places where those patents are published and i highly advise to take a look to take a look and to read what's there and to learn because the future is uh, owned by the ones who are unlearning very fast what is not good for them and learning pretty fast what uh, is new and can be applied immediately Thank you very much again, uh, the team at LA Token, for this opportunity. Hopefully, it was not too technical for me as a guy with that uh, uh, excuse, which is no, which is no longer there. Um, it wasn't easy to do that, but hopefully, it was okay. It was great. It was great. I, I have a few follow-up questions, and thank you, Adrian. If that's okay, do you have a few more minutes? Yeah, of course. All right. So. A few quick questions. We you talked about these these key patents, and I know there were a few others that were filed during this time as well. But a quick question is why this time? Was it because there was opportunity seen, or was it because some of these things are very big, momentumous, or infrastructural change that it was best that no one else saw? Uh, these types of things get followed. W what is your opinion as to why these were filed now as opposed to before or, or after? Plus? There are, there are two, two reasons. One of them could be the level of advancement in uh, these technologies. It's like uh, you worked, uh, it, it's like every overnight success has 10 to 20 years of work. Nobody, nobody sees that. Right. No, it could be overnight. five years or three years. An overnight success. Everybody, everybody will see if you are doing music. Everybody will see when you reach the top ten. But right. nobody knows that at a certain moment, maybe you played on a street and it was okay, or you played uh, in um, in a bar and you didn't have money to go back uh, uh, to to your house by taxi, and maybe when you went back, the power was uh, off or. Crazy things like that, and the 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 second one, especially for for Microsoft and Visa, and this is applicable also for companies like Facebook. We also uh, what uh, uh, happened with the idea of uh, of Libra. So I, I'm I'm going beyond now the the patent idea, but I'm going toward the new ideas. You saw that now uh, Facebook uh, uh, allowed the payments uh, in WhatsApp, and uh, I want to see, and for sure we will see big moves from Apple, from Amazon and Google. Why? They have a huge range of users already. They have infrastructure and they all want somehow to take a cut from this market and also uh, to have as much from what we all want now to be involved with, like. Uh, a widely adopted crypto or digital currency, right? right. It, be, because after 10 years of blockchain and on Bitcoin, still we don't have one coin 
which is adopted everywhere. Do we have it? No. No. I mean, or is it, does it exist today? Does it not? I mean, I think that's a big, big open-ended question for a lot of people, especially you throw in, you know, the stable coin environment, you throw in uh, central bank digital currencies, you throw in the examples that you have, you've got a big, big melting pot of, uh, of currencies or even assets. One, one winner to declare them all has yet to be seen and, and maybe there won't be, but you know, how, how I think you're bringing up a good point is how, where will the application be first and foremost, right? Where's the platform? Where is the application? And then from there, how will things shape out and where will the uh, interoperability become uh, as well? With, uh, we, we see with banks, there are, there are two, uh, there are two approaches. There are banks uh, decide, deciding to be crypto friendly and there are banks <clears throat> When you when you move, let's say, a payment from Binance in your account, they, they will shut down your account. V Visa is um, uh, <clears throat> it was an example discussed before. Um, in 2013, one guy, <laughs> Nick Halik, who is a multimillionaire, I did two events with him in in uh, in uh, Romania, and uh, this guy is uh, is. It's a totally crazy guy anyway. You, you could search him on, on, uh, on Google, Nick Halik. And uh, he has like 16 uh, um, uh, streams of income. He's the first uh, uh, astronaut, uh, civilian astronaut of uh, Greece and Australia because uh, the guy lives in, uh, in the United States, in uh, Greece and Australia. So uh, has multiple citizenships. And he told me, okay, I went to NASA because I wanted to become an astronaut. And NASA asked me if I have credentials. And after that, uh, he went to Russia and Russia asked him, do you have money? <laughs> so he had money to pay for it. And he told me one thing in 2013. And, and at that moment, he rocked my world, basically. He said, um, when you are searching for business opportunities, don't go to search for gold with the others. Build shovels for them. Or, uh, um, and uh, this was mentioned. Um, it, it, it's the first time when I when I I hear this mentioned during the last uh, ten years, I believe. And I I go to many conference events, but until today, I didn't see this uh, mentioned somewhere. And um, I wanted to, to, to bring this, uh, this idea because uh, Visa is such a business. They are not a bank. They are providing shovels for banks in, in, uh, in the form of uh, uh, the, the card license so they could move money, um, have merchant accounts and this and that. And companies like Visa, for them, is the low hanging fruit to be part of uh, something which is very easy to be, uh, to be uh, used as a top up and to be paid using their cards. They have so many cards, they have so big, huge adoption and for them is low hanging fruit to create or to be part of this widely adopted currency which will not create the problems created now, okay, if you are moving some money from that, my Binance, from the Binance account, you will have your, your account shut down. So, um, so there's a huge stake here, please. Yeah. So what does this mean for entrepreneurs? So we've got Visa who, among other areas that you mentioned as well, has really stepped up in this world of digital currencies. Um, you mentioned also Microsoft, uh, you know, Radia Tech and others. I mean, what do these patents provide and what should founders get excited about when looking at these patents and maybe what does it mean to them, right? Is this something they can build on? Is this something they should be exactly. cautious of? First thing is, is something they, they could build on or um, they, could be they could build something which could be very interesting for the 
the companies issuing these patents to, to buy as a new investment. I would look at incubators at, and accelerators where Visa, Microsoft, and other companies are partners looking for the next big thing. People, people said, um, I, I saw dialogues about, okay, during the, the COVID, the investment world is different. If a project is very good, you will always find investors for it. Everybody's looking for, for that. And even one thing I saw in the last one year and a half, which was not happening before, many family offices, they were very conservative and they were not very present in the tech space or in the crypto space. They have dedicated people and they are looking for the next big thing. And we are at the beginning of a potentially new economic crisis, which was generated by, uh, by uh, this pandemic. But let's not forget that during the previous big crisis, 2008, 2010, we had emerging companies like Uber, Airbnb and others so uh, the history is repeating itself. In an exciting way, hopefully. I mean, we've got, we've got a big wave forward, uh, I would argue, in a, in a good way of, of what's changing, right? And we just had things accelerated, as you mentioned. The idea of what we talked about on the last panel and other episodes here on BCTV is everything has been digitized way faster than most expected, uh, jumping ahead of where some industries were, um, which is exciting, which leads me to my last question for you is what has you excited about all this? You know, we just went through three big patents, exciting, but what more, what is, has, what has you excited in the world of digital currencies uh, and beyond? Because I see the, I see, I see the future. Somehow I see the future. Mm -hmm. What does the future look like? What's exciting about it? It's like, um, um you you post a, a very difficult questions because I, I i didn't think of okay why i'm excited i'm excited because i i like what i what i'm seeing i'm excited mm -hmm. first because um seeing these things which initially when i look at them i don't have a clue what is there they make me to to push myself and to to uh, to dig deeper and and to learn and uh, as said before, it helps me to, to create the process to unlearn what is not good for me and to learn something new. Um, it's easier than ever today is like to, to create a new bank. Ten years ago, it was like, okay, you need to be Bill Gates to be able to do that. Or I don't know, just, just an example. So um, this logo of Visa... I have one here, by the way. Let me. Okay, I have one. Oh, Visa. Hey, all right, there we go. No, don't show any numbers. The Visa. We all know the logo. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can show the numbers, but not the CVV. Will not work without. There you go. There you go. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, this. You see now Visa and Mastercard. Maybe you see Amex. On the the cards of the future, you can see. I don't know if you want to invent something called xyz it's possible in few years to have one million cards with this xyz on them you know th this is what's exciting mm -hmm. for me and uh, the uh, the kicker for this is like uh, uh, when you ask this question somehow in my mind came okay why i'm i'm this excited and i i have the answer now i didn't have it two minutes ago um in yeah 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 and uh, this, this this is the real reason why a uh, few years ago i went for the first time there was a nice fair a fashion fair in london cor called pure london and uh, basically you can see there all the all the important british uh, fashion companies trying to uh, to find clients from abroad and also you can see some exhibitors there who are trying to enter the British market so in my mind at that moment the the fashion industry uh, meant H&M, uh, Canvello I'm talking about the uh, mainstream uh, 
uh, Zaga, uh, brands like that. And in my mind, say, it was this impression that if you want to create a fashion brand, this is a huge deal. When I went to this uh, uh, expo, uh, a huge event, I saw that around 30, uh, 30% of the brands were new brands just created that year. And discussing with some people, because I'm, um, if, if I want to learn something, I ask questions. For example, if I meet a client, and if I want to, if he has a nice property, and I want to ask him, okay, what kind of business did you do or what happened that allowed you to have this property? And some people are saying, of course, if they did some illegal stuff, um, maybe maybe they don't share this. But I I, I like to 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 inquire about models. Uh, and sometimes I ask, okay, uh, how much money you are doing with this business? How much is the salary of your people? So seeing 30% uh, uh, new brands, this was mentioned in, in the panel there. Um, I, I said, come on, but I was, uh, I, I had the impression that everything is already established here. So I, I talked with some guys from those new brands and they told me, well, pretty, it's, it's very easy to create a new brand. You have an investors, you have some investors, you have a creative team and um, uh, usually a factory in China or somewhere else. And I said, okay, but with, with, so, many, with so many fashion brands, how can you come with 30% new brands? And two persons told me, you see, Adrian, People are always look. I always looking for something new, so there is always space for something new, even in a, in a very very crowded place as the fashion industry. I was there because um, um, two companies there were clients to my uh, my marketing agency. So normally I, I went to to visit them there to see what other people are, are selling. So those guys said, okay, it's all the time there is new space for something new. So in other industries here, like uh, blockchain, FinTech, post-blockchain, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, it's tremendous space for novelty. And they said, this logo here, which is Visa or MasterCard, there are many companies which will have their millions of cards with this, with their XYZ logos. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be purchased like Visa. The same thing Facebook is doing. Is right. Instagram the potential a new thing? Because maybe Facebook sooner or later will become obsolete. People don't want to stay there. For market techs, okay, the organic reach on Facebook is very small. You have to put money if you want every post to be seen. So people are going on Instagram. So Facebook said, okay, I, I need to buy Instagram because right. if they are spending money on Instagram, it will come to the Facebook pool, which is a very smart thing. What's up? How many users? Pff, huge deal. Uh, let's buy WhatsApp. And now they are uh, putting payment systems in WhatsApp. This is like the world domination. Right. So it's, it's the like idea of all this coming together, all of these exciting things testing and trying and then coming together, it sounds like is, is what's super exciting. And yes, it, it is super exciting that you have the, 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 the possibility to create something with uh, sometimes with limited resources. And after that going, you know that most of the huge businesses were, were started with uh, usually with no income or with, uh, with uh, uh, from broke moments but with a right. good idea and some crazy dreamers. Right. I mean, anything can be started for next to nothing and grow to scale exactly. short or long term. As you said, if, if there's if no you... overnight success, but there is, depending on how you look at it. Um, Correct. Awesome. Well, Adrian, I, I, I want to thank you so much for your time today. We've kind of reached that hour that uh, we're, we're at uh uh, for VCTV today, but uh, any any last uh, thoughts? Where can everyone find you? Just as a reminder, and I'll I'll add your links to the YouTube uh, comments afterwards as well before we sign off here. Up, oh, we we might have Adrian frozen, so we we'll, we'll come back. Uh, everyone, just to let you know uh, again. Thank you, Adrian, for for joining us today. I will post his links up on. 
uh, the video here shortly. So if you can reach out to him or if you want to read the uh, article that he referenced as well. Uh, thank you again to you, our audience, for joining us today, both in our panel uh, prior and to this wonderful keynote that Adrian just gave us. Thank you to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for bringing us all together uh, yet again for another edition of VCTV. I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host. Looking forward to seeing you back here tomorrow for our next edition of VCTV and every day this week. Everyone have a great day. Talk soon.